many of you online would say at some point growing up, you did something to belong, right? I'm going to shift you just for a second and go, let's, let's go back to d- down memory lane. How many of you did things that you regret to this day, but you did them so you could fit in, so you could belong, so you could be part of a group? I think that's what, you know, sororities are and, and all the clubs that we have growing up and all the clubs that we have created as adults, right? And all of the, you know, the dues that we pay. Why do we, why do we pay those? Why do we, because we want to be a part, right? And so at a younger age, it's not about paying. You don't pay, you know, financial dues. You pay physical dues, right? And there have been many trips. There have been many trips to the emergency room that have been preceded by the phrase, hey, watch this. Hey, watch this. I can remember jumping my bike off of a ramp. We had this massive pond and we had a nice deck. It was an old deck, I wouldn't say it was nice. And we had built a ramp up with five gallon buckets. And I decided I was gonna do a backflip into the pond. And the reality and all that was right before I said, hey guys, uh, watch this. The thought in my mind was like, this is crazy. And the reality is as I went off the ramp and I went to pull the backflip, I got upside down and the bike fell and broke my big toe. Now the mud's real squishy in the pond. It was a grizzly bear to get out of there. And so then I can relate to, hey guys, watch this. I can relate to fitting in. And so if we're talking about community, belonging, works, beating perfection, we do all of that for a little bit of approval, for some acceptance, so that we can belong in community, so we can be part of a group. And what limits us today as adults is believing we don't fit in because of our imperfection, our flaws, our failures, our regrets, right? And I wanna tell you that today, all of the things that you did growing up to be a part, whether it was the jacket that you, that you got to have, the ring that you wore, um, all unnecessary to fit in, you fit in already. And so chasing perfection is unnecessary Um, You don't have to be perfect to belong. You don't have to perform anything to belong. You don't have to practice anything to belong. You just simply do. And so why do you think that we want to be perfect? Why, Why do you think that we like perfect? Why do you think that it is like this? It's a uh, uh, it's it's a thing that it's out there in front of us and and it's not that we don't believe we're ever going to reach but man it sure seems sure seems far-fetched. We know that perfect is the enemy of good, right? And so then we can't settle with, it's good enough, that's good enough. Because the the truth is, if you look through the lens of shoulda, coulda, woulda, it's not good enough. And so then the reason that we like or want or prefer perfect is because we're striving for something that gives us approval, right? Oh, nice. And so striving for perfection causes anxiety, though. And that anxiety leads you to disapprove of yourself and your imperfections. And so then we believe that those around us can see all the flaws and all the imperfections. And we believe that they know everything about them. And so we avoid people and we avoid gatherings and we we avoid anything, especially with people who might be just a step above us or anywhere that, that we think or see that they are above us. Striving for perfection causes insecurity. It makes it, di- it makes it super difficult to accept yourself as is. It makes it super difficult to accept yourself as is. This is largely due to how flooded we are with perfection. The perfection that we see in marketing, in our social media feeds, and and in presentations that we watch and videos that we see and clips on TikTok and and that's all good. But the reality is in all of that, even even a TED Talk, right, is put together very well. I don't know if you remember the first TED Talks, they were boring. And now the teams who are putting those together are, it's incredible, right? And so then the sad part that we are not seeing is the illusion that is being presented to us, right? And that illusion is coming through our screens because we don't see the years or the hours um, or the preparation that it takes to present what is being presented, right? 
Social media is only going to show you the moments and the angles and the outfits that the creator wants you to see, right? Ads are created by teams of professionals who are paid to get us to want what they're offering. It's, it's going to be perfect, right? In online church and TED Talks and presentations and any TikTok and all that stuff, they're given by some of the most gifted people, some of the most gifted communicators. And they put countless time in on the subject that they're sharing. We don't see that though. We don't see everything that's behind the scenes. And what is amazing about all of it is we could um, talk to the Instagrammer or the marketer or the presenter and say, hey man, did you like your last post? Did you think that your last post or your ad was, was, or your presentation, do you think it was perfect? And what do you think they're going to say? No, no, it wasn't. And so a lot of people see striving for perfection as a good thing, right? I did. And, and it's motivating, right? It's motivating because it never ends. People who strive for perfection are driven. They're detailed, right? And it's easy to hide behind the label of get it right. Anything that's worth, that's worth doing is worth overdoing. But behind that, the truth is when we fail or when they fail, they see themselves just like anybody else who fails. Failure. And they're back to square one, and now they're having a hard time. Like, oh man, I gotta do this all over again. They beat themselves up, it becomes, you know, a super big deal. And so then, you can't say that you don't belong in community because, the, because you're not perfect. Here's why. Hebrews 10, 14 says, For by one single offering, he was perfected forever, those being sanctified. He has perfected forever those being sanctified. If you call Jesus Savior, if you call Jesus Savior, you've been perfected forever. Jesus makes you perfect. Why do I belong in community? Why does anyone belong in community outside of the fact that John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, the entire world, you, the human race, everybody, that He sent His Son to die. That's it. That's the good news today, but we have to see it outside of the context of the world, and we have to make it personal. It has to mean something to us. And so then, the perfect one came. Why do you belong? Why can you be in community? Why do you not have to worry about perfection? Why? Because the perfect person came. It's, it's tough to grasp this idea that somebody perfect would come and that they would give their life for me. But the Bible said that Jesus is perfect. It says he was perfect. And it said that he was perfected. He was perfected as an offering for you. Hebrews 5, 9 says, Having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all those obeying him. Not accepting this means that you believe that Jesus must do more for your life. That he did not do enough by being beaten, slain, hung on a cross, scourged, all that. That's not enough for me. Not believing that Jesus was perfected and that he became the author of eternal salvation to all those who obey him. Not believing this means you think Jesus must do more for you. But the truth is, you've been perfected. And the problem we have with accepting that is, I've not done enough. And that's a lie. You've done enough. You're good enough. And so why else would Jesus come if not to make you perfect in the sight of God, because God is perfect. God is perfect. Hebrews 10, 14 says, By one single offering, He's perfected forever those being sanctified. Forever meaning all of time, eternity. Sanctified meaning free from sin, holy, righteous, the good life. That's what that means. You must accept that Jesus has perfected you. Jesus has perfected you. At night, we have some, some things that we do with our kids that uh, we just ask them a few questions and we say, who made you? And they say, God. Who created you? God. Who saved you? Jesus. Who empowers you to walk in the authority of God on the earth? The Holy Spirit. It's amazing. Who perfected you? Jesus. Who accepted you? God. Who do you belong to? I'm a son. I'm a daughter of God. That's it. 
It's super simple. You can ask them that any time. And so then you say, what? <laughs> Jesus has made you perfect in the sight of God. You belong. You have a right now. Because of Jesus, you have a right to be called a son or a daughter. Now, a perfect God can only accept perfection. You had to be perfected. You had to be perfected. Aren't you glad that he sent Jesus? You could not bring an imperfect offering to God in the Old Testament. It must be perfect. That's why Jesus was called perfect. Spotless lamb. Now, remember, we are not made perfect because of what we do. We're made perfect because of who Jesus is. So then perfect, so then perfect in what he did, he became a perfect sacrifice. God can't and won't accept anything but a perfect sacrifice because he is perfect. This means we're only perfect in our position as sons or daughters of God. We stand confident in that. We hold fast to it because we believe and accept Jesus and we believe we've been restored through him. That's what we believe. And so then, we're not perfect in our performance and we're not perfect in our practice. We are perfect in our position. Never going to be perfect in your performance, ever. Save your energy. Conserve your energy. You're never going to be perfect in your performance. You're never going to be perfect in your practice, the things that you do. You won't be perfect in those. But you are perfect in your position as a son or daughter of God. You're perfect in your position. Here's what the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us that the law, the law cannot make anything perfect. If the law could make you perfect, there would be no reason for Jesus. If the law could make you perfect, he wouldn't need to come. God wouldn't have sent his son. So then, it's not about our performance. It's not about our practice. It's about our position as sons or daughters of God, right? Which is who Jesus has made us to be. The Bible says you have the right to be called a son or a daughter only because Jesus came and restored you to the Father. So what do we do? So what do we do from here, Dusty? Like, how do we move forward? And this is, a, this, is a, this is for you personally. Matthew 5, 48. Be perfect like your heavenly Father who is perfect. And right now, if you say, it's never going to happen. I've had arguments over this scripture, by the way. Some serious arguments. What's the first word of Matthew 5, 48? B. B. It's your position. It's your position. It's your position. Accept what Jesus did for you. Be perfect like your heavenly Father who is perfect. That means I must shelf. I ain't perfect. Where does that take you? Positive or negative? It takes you immediately to not good enough. You aren't perfect in your performance. You aren't perfect in your practice. You are perfect in your position. Son or daughter. So then your action step is simple. Man, I hope you're with me as we wrap this thing up. Walk in grace, not in works. Be who Jesus saved you to be, not who you think you need to be. Two very different things. I don't have to put on 73 different hats because when I go and meet with these people, I need to be this way. And I meet with this group and I have to be this way. And thank God when... when um, I get around the guys. I get to be that way, right? And when I come home, I got to be this person. When I'm a dad, I got to be this person. No. Be. Just be. Be yourself. We ask our kids all the time, what's the most important thing you're ever going to be? Myself. <laughs> be it. Walk in grace, not in works. Be who Jesus saved you to be. Not what you think you need to do. Well, that's not cool. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. You working for cool? Are you being a son, being a daughter? In Matthew 5, 48, Jesus is saying, I'm making you acceptable to God. That's what he said. Be perfect like your Father in heaven who is perfect. What's he saying? I made you acceptable to God. Whether you like it or not, you better believe it. So then you're perfect in your position. 
You're perfect in your position. Trust and believe and you will be. You're not perfect in your performance or your practice. If you only focus on doing and knowing, you will not belong and you will always feel like you have to do more. But if you trust and believe that Jesus made you perfect, you'll find yourself at home everywhere you go. Everywhere you go, especially right here. I close with Hebrews 12, 23. This is, uh, it says, To the church of the firstborn, it's you and me, whose names are written in heaven. If you call Jesus Savior, your name is in the book of life. Whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Jesus' blood covers you. God accepts you as perfect because he sees you through his son. This is what salvation is about. It's restoration to the Father, but it's seeing ourselves as perfected. Jesus came to perfect us. Today, this is probably the biggest point, today, your perfection is really the willingness to be imperfect and let Jesus pick up where you can't. Because he's the one who makes you sanctified, holy, righteous, redeemed, perfect in God's sight. You were perfected in Christ. You belong in community. Don't do life alone. Because Jesus made you perfect in your position. It's who you are. Ever feel like you don't belong? Ever feel like you just don't belong? Step into a place where you just, the atmosphere, the environment, something is off and you know immediately, I don't belong. I don't belong. You ever wonder why that bothers you so much? Why does that bother us as human beings so much? The reality is this, human beings are driven by five different uh, genetic needs. Survival, love, freedom, fun, and belonging. Belonging being that big one. And so not belonging, just like not having freedom, not having love, and not having any fun is a terrible feeling, right? It's awkward, it hurts, it's numbing sometimes to a point. And to top all that off, every other pain in life uh, without belonging causes us to sit in a place of just like, ugh, right? And we don't know how to handle it alone. And so the big thought today is this, belonging does not require us to change who we are. Belonging doesn't require us to change. When you step into that place, you feel like you don't belong. Belonging doesn't require us to change who we are. It requires us to be who we are. Belonging requires us to be who we are. And a lot of people are so busy trying to change who they are that they forget to be who they are. The root of belonging is the innate human desire to be part of something larger than ourselves. That's the root of the word belonging. It's the innate human desire to be a part of something larger than ourselves. Isn't that what being a part of any type of community is? Isn't that, isn't that part of being, being part of a gathering, whether that be a church gathering or a, a Super Bowl party? Many of us are going to do that next week. We're going to gather in houses and, and Buffalo Wild Wings across the country, and we're going to watch. We're going to, we're going to be together and we'll be right around what? The Super Bowl. And the one thing that everybody walking through our front doors is going to experience is, I'm here for the Super Bowl. We're all here for the Super Bowl. It's the same thing on Sundays. It's the same thing right now as people gather all over the country and watch this online. We're gathering here for the message of the gospel. Same thing on Sunday. We gather here to be in community with like-minded believers, right? Ephesians 1.6. By the way, if you want to go deeper this week, you can go Ephesians one. 6 through verse 14. But Ephesians 1, 6 says, Let us praise God for His glorious grace, for the free gift that He gave us in His Son, by which He made us accepted in the Beloved. You were made perfect. He perfected you. So then, because He made us accepted, we now belong to God. Romans 5, 17 echoes this. It says, God has been so kind to us, He has accepted us because of Jesus. We're accepted. We're accepted. So you can say it again. Write it down. We are accepted. I am accepted. And so that anyone who gives you a cup of water, here's what's really cool about the scripture, Mark 9, 41. I've taught the first half of this, and I've taught the last half of this, and I've missed the middle forever until this weekend. Anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name, just because you belong to me, 
will surely be rewarded. And you've heard of the cup of water and you've heard about not losing your reward, right? Being rewarded. But the most important part of the scripture in Mark 9 41 is you belong. You belong. And you belong to Christ. You belong to Christ. Mark 9 41. You belong. And this is great news. So then you've been accepted. If you're with me in a room right now, I'd say, say I, everybody say, I am accepted. I am accepted, man. Let's take some ownership of it. You belong. You belong to God. I belong. Write down. I am accepted. I belong. Now, when you accept what Jesus did for you, you're adopted into a new family. You're adopted. You're sons and daughters now. You were born rejected, but you're born again accepted. I don't want you to go and, and, and attend somewhere just to say that you did. I want you to belong so you can be a part. If that makes sense. If this is the best you can do right now, I'm always going to be here. I want you here. I want you here. And I believe that you need to be here. And so I'm, thank, I'm just as thankful for you um, as you are for the moments that you get to have with me through the screen. And I appreciate you being here. So now, before I let you go, I want to make it evidently clear. I want to make it so very clear that you understand that you're accepted by God. You're accepted by God. The bottom line is you're accepted by God because Jesus was rejected in your place. I don't just want to drive by that. You're accepted by God because Jesus was rejected in your place. We've been accepted um, we've been accepted because Jesus has been rejected, right? And so this is what makes you perfect in your position. It's not about performance. It's not about practice. It's not about the process. It's not about your progress. You can work your butt off in all those areas. It's not about that. It's about being perfect in your position as a son or daughter. It's what we talked about last week. And so the Bible says Jesus perfected you so that you could be accepted by God. He was the perfect sacrifice, so you don't have to be. You can't be it anyways. Isaiah 53 says, Jesus was despised and rejected by men. There are numerous, period. But there are numerous other verses in the Old and New Testament that tell us the exact same thing. Jesus was despised and he was rejected. He was rejected. And over and over we see the human race rejecting Jesus. And thinking about that can crush you because his creation rejected him. His children rejected him. His sons and his daughters rejected him. But for our benefit, he took our place and he was rejected by his father. He was rejected by his father. Mark 15 says, as Jesus is hanging on the cross, he realizes, he realizes that he's been rejected by the father. And he says, my God, my God, why? Why even you? Why have you forsaken me? And it comes full circle. And he feels disconnected, alone, unaccepted, rejected, forsaken. And I think that Jesus knew this would happen. This goes around, you know, you can go in a round table of the smartest, brightest, most theological people. And, and I think that the take that I have from this is Jesus knew this was going to happen. I just don't know that he knew when it was going to happen. Or how he would feel, rather. He didn't know how he would feel when it happened. I think it's hard for anybody to assume they're going to know how it feels to be rejected. And so when it happened, he knew it was going to, he didn't know how it was going to feel. And so when it happened, it says he cried out with a loud voice. He cried with a loud voice. And the reality is Jesus was rejected by the entire world so that you could be accepted. And in that moment, alone, alone for the entire world. He felt for us what no human should ever feel. No one loves me. No one loves me, even my own dad. And I can't imagine. I've tried to talk myself into that moment. I don't know if you've, if you've been that. Have you ever felt that? Have you ever felt no one loves me. No one loves me. And if you have, you didn't have to. And you don't have to because God loves you. God loves you. Jesus loves you. Jesus loved you enough to, gave, uh, to give his life for you. God loved you enough to give you his son. But the truth is, is I've felt that. I've thought that. I've wondered that. I've wondered that. I wonder sometimes about Heather like, man, sometimes... I can be so obtuse. It's a great word to use today is obtuse. 
why does Heather love me? Why do my kids love me? Why do my kids love me? I mean, they don't even, they, you know, why does Heather love me? And I'm sure there are great reasons and, and that they could have there. And, and, and we're all looking for reasons, right? We're all looking for reasons. God didn't need a reason to love me. And so the reality is no matter what Heather's reasons would be for loving me or no, what, no matter what my son or, or Laney's reasons would be for loving me, it wouldn't be enough because no matter what my self-talk would tell me different. I would say, well, what if I wasn't? Well, what if I didn't? Right? And I would keep going down that path. And the truth, regardless of reason, is this. They love me for the same reason that God loves me. I'm theirs. I'm theirs. Same reason God loves me. Why does God love me? I belong to Him. I'm His. They love me because I'm theirs. I belong to them. And God owes us no explanation for his love. But you find it in Romans 5, 8. It says, but, for, but God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Nobody's perfect. I don't care how pretty they are. Nobody's perfect. I don't care how good that Instagram feed is. Nobody's perfect. I don't care how awesome that TikTok video was. Nobody's perfect. 78 tries, okay? And even the person who shot the video would tell you, Nah, I messed up right there. You just can't tell, right? God loves me for the same reason I love my kids. If you have kids, you can get this. If you don't have kids and you someday will, hold on to this. God loves me for the same reason I love my kids. They're mine. They're mine. They belong to me. It's not their performance. It's not their progress. It's not what they do in ownership around the house. It's not how well they shovel the driveway. I tell my kids on a regular basis, three, at least three times a week, I love you no matter what. You're my son no matter what. You're my daughter. You're my girl no matter what. It's not, it's not their performance. It's who they are. They're mine. They're mine. Heather loves me because I'm hers. Because I'm hers. God loves you because you are his, you're his, and he's gonna love you no matter what, he is. I want every human being to understand this, to grab a hold of this. I want you to know, I want you to believe, I want you to trust. I want you to believe in the love that God has for you, to believe that you belong, to believe that you've been accepted. I want you to believe that God loves you because you belong to him and that's it that's it and I want you to belong to him I want you to belong here and I want you to belong in a community in a group of people in a group of like-minded people I'm not talking about getting together with a bunch of you know blue or red supporters I'm not talking about getting together with your favorite sports team you need to be with like-minded people now now February 2022, find people who believe in Jesus and meet with them on a regular basis. If that's the local church, get plugged in. If you're here in Fort Collins, get with us at The Grove. And I just want to say this, if I belong, you belong. So this is not like, well, Dusty, he's a pastor. No, I got the same past, the same regrets, the same stories, the same heartbreak, the same regret that you do. If I belong, you belong. If I belong, you belong. The only reason we belong is because of the blood of Jesus. There's nothing else. So your action step today is very simple. Are you going to believe this enough to let it change your life? Are you going to believe this enough to belong? Because community is not a place that you visit. The church is not a place that you visit or attend. It's where you belong, and it's where you're accepted regardless. And if you don't feel that or you've been pushed out or blocked out or you've been hurt by that or by a church who's been that, I'm sorry. That's not the gospel and that's not the church. It just ain't. Because of the blood, we can belong to God and because of the blood, we can belong together. Talking about visible love today, visible love today because when you love someone, 
they better know it, right? It shouldn't just be a one day a year where we make somebody aware like, hey, by the way, I love you, right? Love, if you love someone, they better know it. If you want a tagline today, when you love someone, they better know it, okay? If you've got your Bibles and your notebooks, you can get those out. We're going to jump into Acts chapter 2 here in just a second. But like I said, the past two weeks we've been talking about why you belong. Now today we talk about why we belong. What happens when we come together? And so you need to make sure that you go back and get those past two messages. Last week we talked about how to beat rejection. The week before we talked about how to beat perfection. And so belonging happens in you before it happens in us. It must happen in you before it happens to us because you belong to God first. You belong to God first and then you belong to, a, to a, the family of faith, right? To the community of believers, to the church, the big C, capital C church. So it's your relationship with Him that creates and confirms the belief in you that you belong, that you belong. It's, it's stepping into sonship, right? Or, I don't know if there's daughtership is the word, but you're, you have the right to become a son, or a daughter. And so then the last two weeks we've discussed how to beat perfection, how we always figure that we don't belong because we can't measure up to good enough. Talked about that in week one. And then how to beat rejection, beating rejection to belong. You're born again, accepted. That's the biggest point. So we've covered that. Now let's, walk, let's discuss why we belong together. You know, community gives us a social connection and a sense of belonging. And, and we get this by understanding that when when we're loved we know it so then when we love someone they better know it when you love someone they better know it you know church terminology it it says this you can't have community without you and i and so you spell community it's very very cliche it's kind of corny but it's the truth you cannot have community without a you and an i and that's us and so then that means when we meet and we gather around tables, we're just not gathering to eat, but we're gathering to feed our relationships. We circle up and we hang out and we stay late and we arrive early for what? To grow in our relationships. And so we don't just gather around tables to eat, but we gather around tables, we gather in public places at coffee shops and wherever to grow in our relationships, to feed our relationships, to grow in community. Acts 2.42 says this, this is the first church. This is the first church. It says, they were continually and faithfully devoting themselves to the instruction of the apostles, to fellowship, to eating meals together, and to prayer. And if you go on through Acts, it says this, they were devoted to three things, relationship, discipleship, and community. Relationship with God and relationship with each other. It's that vertical relationship and those horizontal relationships, the cross. They were devoted to discipleship, to the apostles' teaching, to growing in their faith, to becoming more like Jesus. They were devoted to that. That's an individual thing that you do. And they were devoted to a community, to continually coming together and being like family, is what Acts 2.42 says. And so when you look at the scripture you see in fellowship, it says this. Fellowship in the dictionary is defined as togetherness, friendship, intimacy, companionship, sociability, which is a really nice word, and community, community, community. And so then the big question is, how do we do that? How do we do companionship, intimacy? No, 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 don't ask me to get vulnerable. That's not me, okay? You don't need to know my business, right? That's, we just came from that place. And so then the big question is, how do we do that? What is our approach? What is our approach? And there are three things that you see in the Bible. There are three things that you see in the first church that lead to community. And I wanna share them with you really quickly. Honor honor, respect one another. It's Romans 12, 10. That means we can't have any pretenders. Honor. Don't just honor because I have to do that for this hour. Honor. If we can't honor God, we won't honor each other. Number two, honesty. Be real with each other. It's Romans 3, 23. Be real. Nobody's squeaky clean, right? Nobody's squeaky clean. Everybody has a past. Everybody has sin in their life, right? You were born rejected. You're born again accepted. You belong because you belong to Jesus, not because you did something right. And so then the reality is if we can't be honest with God, we won't be honest with each other. And the third one is hospitality. Hospitality. Love one another intentionally. If you love someone, they better know it, right? Love intentionally. It's 1 Peter 4, 8 through 9. And the reality is this. If we cannot love God, we will not love one another. And so then it happens in you before it happens in us. With these three, what you need to understand is you cannot lead where you're not willing to go. And so then if you can't be 
honoring, honest, or hospitable with God first, then you're going to struggle to be that with people around you. And so then, so then we can say, if you don't love people, they're going to know it. They're going to know it, right? And so then it must happen in you before it can come out of you. If you're going to bear good fruit, the root of that fruit starts in your heart. It starts the belief in Jesus. To lead, honor, honesty, and hospitality, you must live it first. It has to flow out of you. These are the values of our house. This is how we're raising our kids. And so it's pretty um, uh, difficult for me when I see these not present, where I'm like, wait a second. We teach this. We are this. This is who we are. We have some B attitudes in our house. And so when these three are present, when these three are present, when honor, honesty, and hospitality are present, you've set the stage for unity. The last half of community is unity. And so when there's unity among people, we have community. God's made this very simple for us. And the truth is, community is about having the same rights as everyone else, meaning we view everyone as equal. There is no bar to meet. We're all at the bar. The bar is Jesus, right? And so when someone in the first century church shared a meal or they took someone into their home, they weren't just offering a helping hand like we would say that today. They were sharing their life. They were sharing their life. Why? It's time. We're investing time. It was very personal. It was personal for me to invite you in, right? It was personal for me. It displayed and it affirmed what the apostles taught. This affirmed the apostles' teaching. And after looking at the examples that we see in Scripture and the letters from the Apostle John and the implications from these examples, we can define biblical hospitality as this. It is the welcoming and fellowshipping with all people out of truth and love for Jesus Christ so that people may see Christ more clearly and will join us as believers. I could say that again, but it's on your screen. You need to take a screenshot of that. So we're going to follow up with Romans 12, 13. It says this, when God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality which means to literally pursue the love of strangers. There are a lot of different needs that are represented when that happens, right? But when, when you love someone, they better know it. And so what we learned from Jesus and his disciples was they were all hospitable to everyone, including strangers. And they were hospitable without motive. It wasn't for an exchange. It wasn't a bait and switch. It was out of the love that God had given them out of the love of Jesus Christ. They flowed and they were hospitable with each other. So then we never give in order to receive and we do not treat anyone higher than another. Why? Because Luke 6, 38 says, Give and it will be given to you with good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Running over will be poured into your lap. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. And so then the same amount, you can't sit alone at home constantly and complain about people being mean to you or not being nice to you and not bringing you dinner and not doing the things that you would perceive or want people to do for you if you do not do them for others, right? It clearly states that the measuring cup that we use to dispense our gifts, that we use to give our talents, that we use to give our love, that measuring cup that we use to give that with will be the same one used to provide our dreams, desires, our heart, our need for belonging, our need for love, our need for community. And I believe this verse, Luke 6, 38, I think it's Luke 6, yeah. I believe this verse is the root of, it is more blessed to give than to receive. We all know the feeling of how it feels, what it feels like when we give, when we give, right? So my question to you today is, what is the size of, of your hospitality measuring cup. What's the size of your cup? So then, sit on that. Where do you start? Where do you start? Notice I got my mason jar today. Where do you start? Today, regardless of the size of your cup, you need to cultivate a hospitable heart. 
your action step today is to cultivate a hospitable heart. As we consider putting biblical hospitality into action, most of us can recall a time when we tried to extend hospitality but were met with rejection. Who knows what that person was going through that day, but they didn't like the fact that you were nice to them, right? And so that stunts what you would do then and what you're going to do next, and you can't let that affect the way that you love. You cannot use rejection as a roadblock to prevent you from being hospitable in future occasions. Remember, what you give with is going to be given back to you. If we're to, co to cultivate a heart, a hospitable heart of biblical hospitality, we must refuse to rely on our achievements or dwell on those failures. Remember we talked about overcoming perfection and rejection. It's the same thing when we try to be nice to somebody, right? We must lay aside past rejections, grudges, and we must seek to grab a bigger cup. We have to grab a bigger cup to pour it on, to pour on love, love. Because giving biblical hospitality isn't easy. It's not easy, especially in 2022 when everybody has something, an excuse, an agenda, a hurt. It's hard to give that, but it's worth, it's so worth it. When you grab that cup and you pour it on, it begins with developing proper measuring strategies, okay? We're gonna go a little bit deeper here, okay? Here are a few ways you can get started. I can take somebody a dessert or a meal. You want me to show you one, you want me to tell you, share one of the best ways I communicate hospitality? When I, when I get to meet you for the first time, I ask you what your favorite drink is. I typically tend to meet people over coffee or who cares? And so when we meet, my intention is, what are they drinking? Okay, next time I meet with this person, I'm bringing this. I give you examples. This week, this has happened three times. And people are blown away that I know what they drink down to the, to the uh, you know, amount of sweet cream that we pour in the coffee. Wow, wow. Is that really a wow? No, that's me just being hospitable. And so then I love to understand and know what people's drinks are. And then when I have to have a conversation, good or bad, especially if you work for me, good or bad, I want to present that coffee to take the lid off and let, make sure you know that, that I'm not here to threaten you. I'm not here to offend you. I want to have a conversation. I want to be in community. I want to be in relationship. I want to be in unity in this conversation. And I'm going to prove it to you by sitting this right down right here, okay? Let's have a cup of coffee. Let's have a Mountain Dew. I got so many friends who love Mountain Dew, okay? You can drop a dessert off at somebody's house. You can take somebody a meal. You can make a list of people right now that you know. Every one of us right now knows somebody who needs to be loved, encouraged, right? Loved on a little bit, hugged. We all know somebody. Make a list. Make a list. Write it down. Make a plan. Is what the Bible says. Make a plan to invite them out to dinner. To, I don't like going to movies because they limit the communication. We sit and we watch, okay? But out to do something. Old town. Who knows where? But just make a plan to invite somebody out. Invite somebody home after church today, right? Invite somebody out to lunch after church today. Invite or bring somebody to church. Whoa, that would really change the game. We would show up on Sundays and stop looking around wondering who was coming because we actually bring them with us. Bring someone to church with you. Pray that God will help you demonstrate his character. Let's just say amen. Dusty. All that freaks me out. Start praying that God would help you demonstrate his character to others. That's it. And then purpose. You have to be intentional. Purpose to nurture a heart and attitude of biblical hospitality that sincerely communicates, come back soon. Here's how we define it based on today's message. Genuine hospitality, I'm wrapping up. Genuine hospitality creates an environment where people feel welcomed and accepted. That's great. Those are really good church terms and I know a lot of pastors who use those. What am I really trying to say? Biblical hospitality welcomes people on their terms. Biblical hospitality welcomes people on their terms. It's not about the shirt they wear, the shoes they have on, or the job they have or don't have, the house they live in or don't live in, the shack that they call home. It, none of that matters. Status, cars, etc. Biblical hospitality welcomes people how they come. 
It's a continuous outpouring of love and generosity that reminds everyone, you belong. You belong. You belong. They belong. Consistently, here's what 1 Peter 4, 8, 9 and 1 John 4, 16 say. This backs this up. This is from the Bible. This isn't Dusty 101. This is the Bible. Consistently be hospitable to one another because love covers all and breaks through everything. And all who live in love live in God and He lives in them. Whew. Come on. Above all, maintain. This is 1 Peter 4, 8, 8 through 10. Above all, maintain an intense love for each other since love covers a multitude of sin. Be hospitable to one another without complaining. Based on the gift each one has received, use it to serve others as good managers of the various or the varied grace of God. It's the varied grace of God. If we're going to be how we community, right? If we're going to be, then when you love someone, they better know it. And it needs to be centered around Jesus. When you love someone, do they know it? Do they know it more than one day a year? Do they know it every time they interact with you? Romans 15, 7 says, Accept one another as I have accepted you. Hospitality is not always about money. It's not always about time. It's encouragement. It's friendliness. It's authenticity. It's cooking. It's welcoming. It's inviting. It's bringing. It's loving. It's loving. And what you need to know is when you welcome someone, you send this message. When I welcome someone, when I welcome someone on their terms, what I'm saying to them is, you matter to me. The second thing I'm saying is, you matter to God. You matter to God. And we deleted that last part off, but it's time to bring it back. Time is short, right? When I welcome someone in their terms, I'm saying, you matter to me and you belong to God. You matter to God. So then, do you know somebody who needs to know that? Do you know somebody right now that needs to know that they matter? Let them know. Let them know. And because of what you believe, through conversation and relationship, they'll understand you matter to God. Your hospitality, your hospitality can be their hospital. I don't know anybody who doesn't need a little bit of Jesus' love. It always starts with the person you know. Everybody right now has that person on their heart. Be thinking about them. Pray for them. Shoot them a text, give them a phone call. We've got this thing going right now. We're cold calling people all the time. Hospitality is always good medicine, period. There's never a time where hospitality has been a bad idea, ever, ever. Hospitality is always good medicine. Sometimes it might take a little longer. Sometimes it might take a little bit more investment. Sometimes it might need to be adjusted. But I think that we can all grab a bigger measuring cup today of hospitality and be more consistent with how we show people the love of Jesus, especially those who are closest to us, those who are in our circle, those who are around us. And so then what you see in Acts 2, 44 and 46 is this. This is our core scripture today. If you're going to hang on anything, write, take notes. This is it. Acts 2, 44 and 46. All who believed in Jesus as Savior were together. There's, there's some trail off, but it's a, it's a repeat of what is said in 46. They met continually day after day, worshiping in the temple courts, Continue with one mind and breaking bread in various private homes. They ate their meals together with joy and generous hearts because they shared everything. They were like family. That scripture goes on to tell us that they sold possessions and they gave to everybody. It was, man, it was come one, come all. We're in this together. Jesus, right? And we all rallied around Jesus. Now, two things I want you to see in verse 46. They met every day. There was big group worship. They worshiped every day in the temple. And they also, after that, was like, hey, you come to my house? Hey, you're going to their house? Okay, man, well, I'll catch you tomorrow. What? I'll catch you tomorrow right here. Cool. And then you're going to their house. And then the second thing is they met every day in smaller groups from house to house. And so they met in the temple to worship, and they went to smaller groups to remember Jesus. They broke bread to remember who he was, right? And they prayed deeper. Those house-to-house -house meetings were deeper gatherings because of the relationship, right? You went with and to whose house that you had relationship with. And so then relationship has to be a focus. That's what Acts 2.42 tells us. Relationship, discipleship, and community. That's our focus as the church, the Big C Church, 
And that's why we gather. And so then, remember that relationship, discipleship, community. Now, there was no pretense to worship, right? There was, there was no pretense, there was no prereq to come to somebody's house. It's the same as there's no pretense to show up to Old Town or Riverwalk, right? Or the gathering place or the campus marshes, wherever you want to be, wherever you gather. There's no pretense except the one that you create. What's, what is it? Hey, is this, does, this, does this look all right? Do I look good, girl? Is this good enough? You think, like, we good? That's the only pretense. Does this look okay? Who created that? Me. So then, there was no expectation of you in that time, right? So there was no right or wrong way. There was no certain way to dress. There was no certain way that you had to talk. You didn't have to shelf yourself. You didn't have to put yourself on the back burner to belong to this. It was come as you are. Come as you are. There was no expectation. You just did. You just did. And the expectation was God. And the expectation was, what is God going to do today? What's God going to do today? And so then people came together to gather. They came together to gather, right? That's, that's what together is. Jesus was the destination. God was the expectation. I'll say it again. Jesus was the destination. God was the expectation. It was not about a dress or, or a place. It was about a group of people and what God was going to do in us because we gather. Do our gatherings in 2022, do our gatherings in 2022 mirror the daily gatherings of the first church? Because we really gather for three reasons, three very, very important reasons. And they are this, worship, discipleship, and evangelism. Worship, Discipleship and evangelism. Now, here's the thing. Those are church words, Dusty. Like, not real fired up about what you just said. Hang tight. Buckle it. Hey, don't leave. We're good. All right? We gather to worship God. We gather as a body of believers to worship God. We gather together on Sundays to worship God. God doesn't live in the church building, right? He lives in the hearts of every believer. Now, his presence finds us when we gather in his name. And so then, when those who are saved by Jesus come together to worship, because we gather in his name, we sense his presence and we are mutually encouraged. Mutually encouraged in our worship. But more importantly, our worship glorifies God. Why? It shifts the focus off of us. So then we're really sowing time. We're giving everything, all of our focus all of our heart, all of our attention shifts to God. It's the one time a week they used to do this every day. I still do this every day. It took me a long time to get to it, okay? But man, if I don't have a time in my day where I shift my focus from everything that I have to do, what's going on in our family, what we have to do over here to get this done, what, what has to happen for this to take place, if I don't get my mind off of that and say, you know what, Lord, because you woke me up today, I honor you, I worship you, and I serve you. What is worship, Dusty? Worship is singing, serving, and giving. You've heard that we worship God with our time, talent, and treasure. That's a good Christianese for you. But all three of these flow from your heart, singing, serving, and giving, because they take your time, they take your talent, what God's given you, what, God, what gift God has given you for the kingdom of God, right? To serve other people, to love other people unconditionally. Super easy because it's in you and it's not in me, right? And then... Generosity. They gave with generous hearts. They had generous hearts. Why? Because where your, where your heart is, that's where your treasure is. Right? Where your treasure is, where your heart is. So then in that, worship is singing, serving, and giving. All three of these flow from your heart to God because of his goodness to you. Because of his faithfulness to you. Because of his consistency in your life. That's why. That's why. And so then, time, talent, treasure, sing, serve, give are the same. Now, the second thing, we gather to become better followers. It's an easier word than discipleship. We think about discipleship, like, oh, good, good grief. Like, now, we gather to spur one another on towards good works. We gather to spur one another on towards good works, towards love and good deeds. The discipleship of believers is key to the health of the church. Key to the health of the church, knowing, 
knowing the mission of the church is to go into all the world and create disciples, to make disciples, we are intentional to grow in our relationship with God through the teaching of His Word. It happens. We come to know God more when we get taught His Word. It's the teaching of His Word so that we can become, so that we can become better followers. We can become who He's called us to be. So then, what is discipleship? Discipleship is being devoted, disciplined, and diligent to seek and learn what Jesus has taught us. It's what Acts tells us. Be devoted to the teachings of the apostles. What did they teach? What Jesus taught them. Okay? So then discipleship is being devoted, disciplined, and diligent to seek and learn what Jesus taught. The third reason that we gather is to share the gospel with unbelievers. We want to share the gospel with new people. We know it's a massive step for that person to come through the door. We understand there's an amazing opportunity for God, for God to do something, to spark something in someone's life. And so then, we gather to share the gospel with unbelievers. Now, now we have a huge part in that. We have a huge part in sharing the gospel with unbelievers. It is imperative that the gospel is presented here. Whether you be online or in the room, here, every time we gather, the gospel must be present. Contrary to popular belief, non-believers do attend church. This is not just a holy huddle or an inner circle or an insider's club. More surprisingly, many churchgoers aren't even believers. They just go because they believe they should. They're not tuned in. They're scrolling their social media, their Instagram, their they're sleeping. They're doing, some, they're doing anything but being tuned in on the edge of their seat, taking notes, opening their Bible, and seeing what God would have to say. Therefore, we're going to focus on having an environment that welcomes people as they are. Why? Because we trust that it is through the preaching of God's Word, through the sharing of the gospel, Right? The preaching of God's word that faith is born in the heart of a believer. That's how faith is born in the heart of people. Now, evangelism must go beyond these walls during the week. It has to. It has to go beyond the cushions of your couches. It has to go beyond the walls of your office. The, the gospel has to go beyond this moment right here. Beyond the windows of your car. If you're on the podcast right now, listen to me. Right? Remember, the building does not do the saving. Jesus does. Jesus does. The church is not a monument that we visit, right? The church is a movement that we are. We are called to be the church. That means all of us should be doing our part. All of us should be doing our part. The place was wherever the people were. And because they gathered in Jesus' name, he was there. And today, we simply need to invite Jesus into our gatherings. Nothing has ever happened by assumption. So you can't just show up. By the way, if you don't know what assumption means, ask somebody older. And they'll help you figure it out. We have to invite Jesus into everything we do. Our house, our marriage, family. That's a lot. My conversation with my neighbors, my conversation at the office, my conversation in my, in my group me, in my Marco Polo, in my FaceTime, in everything, because in our gatherings, especially when we gather as the, the Capital C Church, when we gather in this place, we gather to worship God, to make disciples. Remember those three things. Those three things are really worship God, make disciples, share the gospel, build relationships, reach people, and celebrate what God has done in our lives this week because we have faithfully followed. That's why we gather. God says if we do that, he will continue to add to the number of those being saved and called to heaven, meaning they have an eternal home. It's huge. Which means our action step today is this. Remember, conversation. Conversation. What's that mean? That means Monday through Saturday, go be the church. Be the example of Jesus at every local gathering place in your community, at your local office, and in your house. Have a conversation. And when you do that, what's going to happen is God is going to start to build a bridge to that person's heart where they're going to receive the invitation that you give them to come to church. And when you invite them to come to church on Easter in just about 10 weeks, less than that, they're going to say yes because you've had conversations. Talking today about the difference between attending 
and assembling, attending and assembling. And so to attend means to be present. So you attend a lot of things and you're physically there, you're present. To gather is what we talked about last week. I'll recap that with you in just a second. But to gather means to accumulate, to amass, to pile up, right? To assemble means uh, the action of coming together or a group of people gathered together in one place for a common purpose. With his power, great things happen. We said in Acts 2.47, it plays it's been playing out here at the Grove for the past eight weeks. And here's what it says. The Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. We've seen 49 new people come through the doors over the past eight weeks here. 32 of them have taken a notebook. 23 of them have received a Bible. It's huge. 19 of them have prayed to receive Jesus. 19 salvations. Heaven's number has been added to. And one of them has gotten plugged in to serve right here. It's amazing. God does amazing things when we assemble in his power and in his presence, when we invite him in. And so then assembling is not attending, though, and assembling is not gathering. Henry Ford said this. I love Henry Ford. I'm a Ford guy. He said this. Coming together is the beginning. Keeping together is progress. Working together is success. When you fully assemble, when you come together, that there was unity, all things in common. When you come together, that's what you see. And so how do we come together? This week in one of our team meetings, I had a whiteboard out. And if you're taking notes with me, you can do this. You can do this real quick. Just across the top of your paper, write the word attend. And then in the middle, write the word gather. And then out to the, the far right there, you can write uh, assemble. And what I want you to understand is att when we attend, people attend to connect. So if you're in this column, people attend to connect. They're connecting because they want community. They're attending because there's just a slight belief. It's this much belief to step into the presence of God and God change your life. So everybody who walks through the doors, everybody who clicks onto this message, believes at least this much or, they, or you wouldn't be engaged or they wouldn't be sitting with us, right? And so for that to be a, an actual belief, we have to be willing to be, right? We're going to come in and sit alone or with our family, with our, you know, our husband, or our kids, somebody. But we have to just sit here and be for 40 minutes or so, right? And, and the idea of attending is we're attending a building. We attend a building, okay? Now, if you go to the middle column, you're talking about gathering. What you see with gathering is when you gather, people come to consume. We're here to learn. We want to know God more. We're consuming, right? And we gather out of relationship. We know people here. And so then we're still in the middle column relationship. And because we gather and we're in relationship and we're learning, we experience growth. That means I believe. I believe. There's a belief coming in. When I gather, I believe. And when you gather, you're part of the body. It's not about the building. I'm going to be part of the body. Okay. Now, if you go to that far right column, we're talking about assembly. Now, when we assemble, we are, we are contributing. We contribute. We go from consuming and learning. There's a belief. Now I have become, right? And so then we become. So it's we assemble. And because we're assembling, we contribute. Contributing leads to discipleship. That's us going. It's Acts 2, 42 through 47, which creates depth in our relationships. In our growth, we become rooted. So that we become disciples. And now it's not just about the building with attendance. And the body with the gathering, it's about being part of the movement. This is, this is big time for Christians and believers, right? And so what I want you to see, if you have those three columns, write down this, under this side, 73% of Christians, these are people who already believe and they come to church, 73% of those people attend. They're only attenders, that's all they do. Some of them aren't even saved. They just attend, 73%. 19% of Christians believe they're part of the body. They gather there's relationship, there's growth, and they believe, but only 19% of those people are believers. 8% of Christians are part of the movement. They actually take what we do on a weekly basis and go and take it to the community where they live. They lead it in their house, they lead it at their job, wherever. 8%, 8%. And so then what you need to see is when you come in and you look at yourself or you see yourself, it, the Bible tells in Psalms 92, 13, that the righteous are planted in the house of the Lord and they flourish in the courts of our God. They flourish, right? They only flourish because they're planted. And so if you think about a tree, if you think about you, you're a seed and you're called to be planted, planted in the house of God. 
And so if you're planted in the house of God, then you understand. But being that seed and staying a seed is only attending. Never take root. You attend every now and again. And again, this is not to, not to you know, throw stones or anything like that. When you attend, you're simply a seed. And you have to ask yourself, am I, am I planted? Am I planted in the house of God? Because what do you need to take root? To take root, you need to gather. Growth comes when you gather. So then roots start to, now I'm starting to be planted in the house of God. Instead of just attending, now I'm part of the gathering and roots are forming. Now what do you need to flourish? Assembly. Assembly. You're going to bear fruit. Flourishing means there is fruit. Right? I'm thriving. That takes assembly. Now this leads to our core scripture today. It's Hebrews 10, 25. Let us not give up on assembling together as some are doing. Instead, let us encourage one another all the more since you see the day of the Lord is coming near. If you look at this Lego house here that Oscar, Kaz, and Lanny put together, every part of this house needs each other. Needs, needs each other. So there's not, I can't pull one piece off and this house be complete. This is the model. This is all 236 pieces of the house. Each piece needs each other. So many scriptures to back that up. But we're talking about assembling today. And so then, when we come together in, in Jesus' name, we experience his presence. We get to experience his power. But together means it takes more than one. It means I can't be home alone. It takes people. And you can see it's just... Um, it's, the difference between, it's just God, God and I. It's just God and I and we do this. But the Bible tells us, God tells us it's not good for man to be alone. That's not the way he designed it. He says it's not good for you to be alone. And matter of fact, when you're alone, that's when the enemy attacks you. That's when the enemy attacks you. And so assembly can't happen without relationship. Assembly can't happen without community. If you've been with me the past few weeks, you understand exactly where I'm going. When we assemble, we flourish. We flourish because we become disciples. There's depth. We contribute. We become the movement that God's called us to be. So from team sports to the fire department, from every branch of the military to the local church, when we assemble, there is life. We become one. Remember the whole Bible summed up when Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. What's he saying here? He's saying, have relationship with God and people. He's saying, have community with God and people. And if you are, if you are, if you'll do that, and if you will not give up on assembling, you will flourish, right? Now, culture, social media, COVID, VR, <laughs> technology, right, has done nothing but created separation among us, and it makes you feel alone, right? Right? God doesn't want you to live alone. He wants you to live in community. He wants you to live assembled. Assembled. Now, if you look at this sweet Lego house, if you look at this, which piece of this is the most susceptible? Which piece of the house that you see right now, which piece is one of the first ones to go? If Axton, my two-year-old, came and took this house right now, which one would you be like, ah! Right? Which one? If you came to me and said, hey, Dusty, I see that. You see that orange piece inside there? Yeah, could you get that for me? Could you get that for me right in there? And, and, and can I borrow that? Now listen, I would love to do that. I'd have to take this whole house apart to give you that piece. I'd have to take this whole house apart to give you that piece, right? And so then I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. But you say, hey, hey, I need to get this little piece right here off the top of this edge right here. If I get that corner of that roof, could, you, could I borrow that? Sure. Easily acceptable, most susceptible to like... to to destruction, right? If you wanted a piece of the roof, it would be real easy. It would be really, really easy. And this is, this is the difference, right? When it, comes to, when it comes to the difference between attending and assembling, you're seeing it right here. Outside or inside, which one's easier for the wolf to catch? If you're going to be under attack, which one's easier for the wolf to catch? It's the one on the edge. It's the one here or here or here with this stool, right? Maybe that door handle, this door handle, this surfboard sticking on here, right? Which one's the easiest to catch? It's the one on the edge. It's the one that only attends every now and again. It's the one that doesn't take next steps. It's the one that fails to engage in relationship. It's the one that fails to engage in community and outreach, right? It's the one 
who doesn't let the gospel change their life. They just come and sit. 73% of people are this way, right? It's important to assemble, to not just attend. And when we assemble, we don't want to be the ones on the fray. We don't want to be the ones on the edge. These are attenders, and they, and they have their place. But at some point, you go from an attender to a gatherer, and from a gatherer to an assembler. You go from, um, you go from a slight belief to believing to becoming, right? You go from um, just wanting to connect to consuming to contributing, right? And so then you go from wanting community to finding relationships to becoming a disciple, right? Relationship with God and with people. And so then it's important that we assemble. Why? Because we're all sheep. We're all sheep. That's what the Bible calls us. Like all sheep, we've gone astray. All of us, that's me included. We are the sheep of his pasture. And so then if you're on the edge, if you're on the fray, if you're one of the top most closest to the edge pieces, right? What should you be doing? Not, it's not to stay home. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. I need in that door right there. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. I need to get in there. Excuse me. If you're on the fray, you need to get right in the middle of the house. You need to get to the middle of the house. You must be in the middle of the flock, right? Because the wolf only catches the ones on the edge. We need each other. We need the body. We need, we need to be around like-minded believers, man. We must walk in agreement. We have to find people we can walk in agreement with, right? We need the relationships. You need the relationships in your room online. You need the relationships in this room. And you can say, you know what? That sounds good. That sounds a lot like gathering, though, Dusty, doesn't it? It sounds like gathering. And isn't that what we get in the gathering when we gather? And so then there is a humongous difference between attending and assembling. I think you see that today. But what's the difference between gathering and assembling? I love old Ford trucks. Love them. And for a long time, I used to have three parked at the, at the back part of my parents' house. They were behind the barn. And if I told you today, those three trucks would make one truck, by the way. And so there was just, it was just a, a plethora of old Ford truck parts, right? From 77 to 79. And if I told you, hey, if you're at my house, my parents' house, we were out there visiting, and I said, hey, come back here and check out my old truck, man. You're going to love this thing. And you're like, okay, cool. And, and, and you come back and you're like, I don't see an old truck. I see there's some wheels over there and you got the axle there. The transmission's in that truck. And you're going to take the bed from that truck and you want the mirrors off that one. Where's the motor? Well, the, mo motor's, the motor's um, sitting in a tire over, around the corner. You would say, all I see is junk. Matter of fact, like nothing is together. Nothing is assembled. You have nothing assembled, right? And even though all the parts are there, right? Everything for one complete truck is there. It's all gathered behind the barn. It's not assembled. And an unassembled truck won't go anywhere, ever. Even if it is gathered, it won't go, right? And God told us to assemble, assemble, not just to gather. So then if you have that Lego, let's just, let's just pretend that you do. If you have that Lego, I would challenge you to do this. Take it. And your Lego might be your favorite color, right? And it might not be. But let's pretend that, that the Lego that you have, the Lego that you hold, people in this room are holding Legos. The Lego that you hold is a brick. It's a brick. Now, if it is a brick, okay, let me hold this up here. If each Lego that you have is a brick and you're holding that brick, that brick has worth, right? from 75 cents to cheap brick to $5 for antique brick, right? You could pay up to 25 bucks for brick, I think. So it has worth, it has value, right? There's, it has strength, it's heavy. You could do some damage with that brick, right? It has beauty, it has character. Each one of those bricks is super important, right? And if everybody here took their brick and we all put them together, what you would get is strength, right? You'd get unity, the beauty would get better, the worth would get better, the strength would get better. Everything increases when we put all of our bricks together. And when you put all the bricks together, guess what you have? You have a house. That's assembly. A house is where a place where someone can dwell. It's where you can meet with people. It's where you can meet with someone. 
It's where you can speak with someone. It's a place where you can build relationships. It's a place where you can build and be a part of a community. When we assemble together, we're unified. It says they had all things in common. They were together and shared everything. They had all things in common. And when we assemble, we are one in worship. We sing with one voice. Many of us, but we're assembled. We're together one voice. Nothing beats, nothing beats that. When we pray, we're walking in agreement. It's one prayer and everybody is agreed. We're assembled in that. We're assembled in our belief when we step into a gathering. We're assembled. And when we assemble, we not only spur each other on to good works, but the Bible says that we sharpen each other if we assemble. So then Hebrews 10.25 says, Let us not give up on assembling together, as some are doing. Instead, let us encourage one another all the more. Since you see the day of the Lord is coming near and near. What's that mean? Our assembling shouldn't be decreasing right now. It should be increasing because the day of the Lord is near. It's approaching. So then we should be coming together. We should be gathering. We should be assembling more. We should be assembling more. This is real community. And real community takes real relationships. So then, to wrap up the community series, we gather in community, we grow in relationship, and we go as disciples. This is our why. It's rooted in Acts chapter 2. And God tells us, do not neglect any of this. And the reality is this. If we do not neglect, if we do not give up on assembling, we're going to reach our houses. We're going to reach our cities. We're going to reach our communities. We're going to see God change the places that we inhabit as believers because we assemble. And then when people step into your house or into your office or into your church, they're going to feel real community because there's real relationship and you brought them. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the fact that I get to share the message of assembly today. Thank you, Lord, for your love, for your grace, for your power, Lord, for your mercy that covers us. Lord, thank you for helping people take steps today and understanding how important it is that we come together, that we assemble. Lord, help those who need to take a next step today do that. Give them boldness and confidence to do so. And I pray these things all in Jesus' name. Now, if that's you and you need to take your next step, you need to pray to receive Jesus, you need to reestablish a relationship, and I would love to pray with you, you can email me, dusty at dustyotis.com. Dusty at dustyotis.com. I would love to walk with you and to talk with you, get you a Bible and a notebook, pray. It's just a conversation. Just let me know. I would love to be there for you. Do not miss that today. If you're not part of a gathering or you are part of a gathering, get to church. Get to church, get back to church. Get with the people, start assembling, and don't sit on the fray. Don't be a loner. Don't go every now and again. Get to the middle, get to the middle of the flock. If today's message spoke to you, I just ask that you share it. Pass it along. Somebody that you know needs to hear it, needs to understand the importance of why we assemble. Now I'm gonna dismiss you. This is out of Ephesians 1, 17 and 18. This is Paul. This is what God wants for you. He says this, I pray the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father would give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. I pray the perception of your mind may be enlightened so you may know what is the hope of His calling and His purpose for you and the great things that He has in store for you. I hope today spoke to you. I hope it helps you. I hope it helps you move forward in your faith. As always, I'm always here. If you need anything, please let me know. Hope you have a great week. See ya.